In this Inspired Insider.com interview, we talk with Robert Posen, senior lecturer at Harvard Business School. He's taught at Georgetown, MIT. He's former chairman of MFS Investment Management and also president of Fidelity. He talks about the best tips for improving productivity that you can have. He talks about his humble beginnings. He even talks about how he handled a schoolyard bully. That and much more coming up now. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm the founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. It's an honor and a pleasure today to have Robert Posen. Robert Posen is a senior lecturer at Harvard Business School. He's taught at Georgetown, MIT. He was formerly chairman of MFS Investment Management, which manages over $300 billion in assets. He was also vice chairman of Fidelity Investments and president of Fidelity Management and Research Company. And right now, most importantly, I wanted to talk to him about extreme productivity. He's the author of Extreme Productivity, Boost Your Results, Reduce Your Hours. Now, Bob gets a lot done. He's taught a full course, course load at Harvard Business School, serving as full-time chairman of the Global Financial Services. He's written six books hundreds of articles, served on many boards of local charities, most importantly, raised a family with his wife of more than, what is it, four decades? Uh, almost four decades. Almost four decades. Congratulations. Thank you. So, Bob, I'm excited to hear from you how you get so much done, so we all can too. But I wanted to include a fun fact about you that, that um, maybe most people don't know. Well, I was a trustee of the Basketball Hall of Fame in Springfield, Mass. And, really? Uh, that comes uh, more from my fundraising ability than my basketball career. But I did have a short-lived basketball career, uh, which I described a little in the book until I had the unfortunate experience of trying to guard Calvin Murphy, who uh, uh, showed me what a really good basketball player looked like. That was in high school, uh, but uh, he still scored 56 points. So... Uh, <laughs> That was pretty good for him, but not so good for me. Early on, you wanted to be an NBA basketball player? Yeah, that was sort of my uh, uh, objective in life growing up in Bridgeport, Connecticut. It seemed very glamorous, and uh, you know, I spent a lot of time playing basketball on the playgrounds and things like that. So obviously, you know, Bob, you've had a successful career. What was a big influence for you growing up? Well, the biggest influence was my mother. My mother was a woman who was born in a family of 12. She was one of the youngest uh, children. And uh, she graduated valedictorian of her high school. But by the time she graduated, both her parents had been dead for several years. She was living with her sisters, uh, uh, or my aunts, in uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut. And she didn't have the financial resources to go to college. So uh, she did uh, wind up working in some construction leasing firms where she was technically the bookkeeper but did a lot of other things and she was the one who pushed myself and my brothers to really concentrate on education and really go to college and i'm in the middle of three sons my older and younger brother are cardiologists so I think really both of them are cardiologists correct wow so how did it influence you unfortunately one, one one has passed away now oh wow they're... sorry to hear that yeah how was it growing up in a big family? Well, it wasn't that big, three children, but it was a very small house, and uh, all of us were pretty big, so it wasn't like a luxurious house. It was this little uh, small house, and uh, the main thing, there was only uh, one full bathroom, so we had to do a lot of sharing. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, yeah, so what was it like, you know, obviously education was really stressed. What was it like early in your career? How'd you get started? Well, I got started mainly because um, we were living in a uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut. It's not a very wealthy town. It's a working class town. And unfortunately, my father uh, had employment issues, was in and out of um, employment. And, uh, you know, I, at a very early age, uh, started uh, working uh, two jobs. Actually, during high school, I worked two jobs. I worked one job for three days a week. I taught uh, 
Hebrew school at the local synagogue. And for the other three days, I worked at a bookstore. And of course, I also played basketball. I played tennis. You know, I tried to have as good a social life as possible. So I really didn't think about it, but you had to be pretty organized and efficient to do all that. Similarly, when I was in college, I basically worked my way through college. I always had a job. I played, uh, at that time, I played uh, basketball as captain of the Lowell House basketball team at, at Harvard. I wasn't really good enough to play for the varsity. So I always tried to do a lot of different things. I wrote on the Harvard Crimson, I played basketball. Uh, I tried to keep my grades up, but I always had a job. So if you always have a job, then you've got to be more efficient with your time. Yeah. So from early on, do you think that's what trained you to be more productive or, that you honed or were you naturally like that? I think it was a combination of that training. Plus, I guess I always like to think of myself as a thinking man's productivity. I mean, if you take my book and all the suggestions and put them together, it comes down to think first and figure out your strategy and then focus in the implementation. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the person I've been most of my life. Yeah. So what inspired you? I mean, you have so much going on. What inspired you to sit down and write Extreme Productivity? Well, actually, it was quite a fluke. Uh, I, When I was uh, a full-time chairman of MFS and I was teaching at HBS full-time, uh, from time to time, I'd write an article for the Harvard Business Review. And I rewrote I wrote one and handed it in, and, and my editor said to me, look, we have lots of people write. You're the only one who hands the article in on time and at the word limit. And we realize that you've got two jobs. How do you do it? We want your secret juice. So uh, uh, Justin Fox, who was the editor, asked me if I would do an interview. And he did a great job in the interview. It, it went uh, sort of viral on the Internet. And then I did a short little article at his request in the Harvard uh, Business Review, written article. And then, you know, everybody started calling me up and, it's sort of interesting because before that, I viewed myself mainly as a finance guy. You know, I was watching all your your talks on major, you know, major networks about finance stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's I mean, I talked about financial crisis and pensions and retiree health. I've done a lot of work on Social Security, you know, banks. You worked with the presidents before. Yeah. yeah. So so, you know, I've been very involved with that. But it's like opens up a whole new area of your life. So people who has never really heard of me or had much interest in what I'm doing. All of a sudden, they're like stopping me in airports and saying, you know, tell me, give me a few things about how I can be more productive. And a friend of mine who's a distinguished professor at MIT uh, called me up and he said, you know, you've really changed my way of reading. Wow. And so, you know, uh, if, if, you, if you don't have children and then you have children as we do, you find that there are sort of all sorts of new ties to people and new things to say to people that you never thought about before. So that's a little bit like I, fi I find with uh, productivity, that it sort of opens up lots of new conversations and lots of new people who might have viewed me before as like, you know, sort of a financial expert and a little bit uh, wonky. Yeah. And so I have two questions about that, actually. Now, I know that, you know, MIT professor, you know, talks about you and your theory of reading. Tell people a little bit about your thoughts and theory about reading. Well, you know, when I was growing up, there was a woman named Evelyn Wood who was very popular as a consultant on reading. And her theory was you should read as many words as you can per minute. And she wanted you to read up to two or three thousand words per minute. Now, actually, it's been shown that if you read that many words, you really don't comprehend very much. So my theory is the exact opposite. Read fewer words per minute, but read the right ones. And that's what I call reading with purpose. So I want you to start before you read anything and think about why are you reading this and what do you want out of this? So you could be reading something for the general themes. You could be reading something actually for the footnotes because you wanted to do further research. You could be reading something because you want to sort of uh, see if there are any new arguments. And so uh, when I get up in the morning, I read the Boston Globe first and I read it in five minutes. And people say, how can you read it in five minutes? And I said, it's real simple. I only read the headlines on the front page that relate to Boston politics. And then I read the sports page and I'm not really interested right. in reading the rest because I'm not trying to get out of the Boston Globe national political coverage or financial coverage, that's not their thing. 
So that's what I mean, reading yeah. with purpose. If you read with purpose, you can not only read uh, more quickly, but you can get a hell of a lot more out of it. Yeah, that's an important distinction because we have goals in life. We should have goals. We, most of the time, we just kind of fall into reading a book or whatever it is, and we don't think of that goal behind it. And I'm, I'm, you know, still encouraging everyone to read your book in its entirety. But for example, if you just want to get like work-life balance, there's like many excerpts on work-life balance in your book. Or if you want to talk about, you know, how to cut down on meetings or whatever that is, you can get that in that individual or, or have the book as like a resource for that individual case. Is that what you're saying? Well, the, other, the other thing I do in my book, which I preach in the book, is to write that you can start by reading the introduction, getting a sense of where the book is, and then at the end of each chapter, there are takeaways. So I yes. always say, Read the beginning and the end of the article. That will tell you where it's going. Then you can decide what you want. And then you read the parts of the middle that really appeal to you. So my book is written for effective readers. Yeah, no, you're right. Because I did notice at the end of each chapter, you have the takeaways. And so it makes it much harder to forget what you just <laughs> learned. <laughs> So I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> so I'm glad you included those in there. Um, so, Bob, what do you tell people when people walk up to you in the airport and say, OK, what give me a secret sauce or or a tip or secret for productivity? What what first comes to mind? Well, I tried to tell them there's like no magic bullet. It's not like, you you know, you, you wave the magic wand. Mm -hmm. What I'm really preaching is a set of methodologies, a set of common sense practices, both how you think about things and how you implement them. So I try not to create the notion, you know, there are these books like the, what, four minute work week or something like that. <laughs> four so second I'm, work I'm, week. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's getting shorter every minute. So I'm, I'm not trying to create some sort of, you know, uh, you know, buzzword or some sort of uh, very, uh, you know, uh, nifty sort of trick. I, I just say to people, you know, there, there, there's some real basics in terms of how you go about thinking things and how about how you go about doing things. Mm -hmm. So I try not, at least when people in the airport say, oh, here it is, you know, with uh, 25 words of one box stop. Here it is. Here's the magic wand. Well, I mean, for you, obviously, that is common sense. And for some people, you know, they don't do it naturally. It's not common sense. What's one thing you tell people just, you know, they say my life is a mess. It's hectic. <laughs> <laughs> Where do they start? Where should they start? Well, I think probably I, I ask them to start by thinking about, and this is where I start the book, is what are your goals for different time frames and mm -hmm. what are your priorities? Yeah. Because you're unlikely to achieve your goals if you haven't thought through carefully what they are. My experience is that most people go through their lives passively. They're responding to something. They're reacting. Mm -hmm. Some people sit in their office all day and respond to either emails, phone calls, somebody coming in. And at the end of the day, they say, well, I work really hard, but what did I accomplish? Right. And the answer is probably very little of what you wanted to accomplish because you didn't start off by saying, these are the things that I really want to get done. And I advocate not only uh, <clears throat> each year, putting out your, you know, writing down your uh, your top priorities for the next year, for the next five years, next week. But I like to have people on the night before each day to look at their schedule and not just think, well, you know, I got six appointments and, you know, four conference calls. I like them to think about what am I really trying to accomplish in each one? What do I want to get done? Not what they want to do to me or just right. being there. And so that's really the critical change in mindset. Yeah. Yeah. So you want people to think of what's your goal in all this or whatever task you're accomplishing. So you're you're being efficient with your time. You know what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. I mean, for instance, we all go to meetings. But the question is, if you're meeting with uh, a group of people who work on your team, well, what are you really trying to do? Are you trying to move forward a particular project? Are you trying to get a new advertising campaign? Are you trying to improve customer service? What are you trying to do? Because you have all these meetings. We all go to all these meetings. At the end, no one's quite clear what happened or what's the meeting. Yeah. And that's really a time sink. Yeah. And the other question is, you know, there's one thing of saying, all right, they come to you, Bob, we need this book. It's great. And there's another time of you actually making time for it. You know, how did you make time when you have all this other stuff going on to actually write the book? Well, uh, I'm, I guess I have found in my life that there are a number of busy people 
who, when I correspond with, get back to me very quickly. And in fact, it always slays me. I mean, when I was president of a company, sometimes I would call up somebody and say, let's get together. And they say, well, I'm too busy. I can't meet with you for another 10 days. And I'm really thinking, what is it that these people are doing that they can't meet with the president of the company for 10 days? And it turns out not to be uh, that important. So, I, you know, I basically uh, have always find myself with enough time to do things. People all are often calling me up asking for mentoring. I work with a lot of people, especially new CEOs on mentoring. I do a lot of things and I always find that I have time because I know what I'm what I'm doing and then I can do it quickly. I'm a speed reader, I'm a speed writer. And part of the reason I could write this book quickly is that first of all, I started with an outline. There's, I would say half the people in the world don't use an outline when they write. Then invariably, when they get in the middle of it, they get lost, they get confused, these sorts of things. Writing a good outline is key. And then second of all, I'm willing to write a first draft. A lot of people have writer's block. They want to make it really perfect, et cetera. That's not possible in a writer's block. Uh, the third thing, I was blessed with a great research assistant, Lucas Goodman, who was really a brilliant research assistant. And he uh, enabled me to, to write stuff and not get diverted uh, by looking at all the empirical studies. He did that work and really helped me a lot. Yeah. I guess one thing is I'm thinking, well, does he, does he have a set time period in the week that he it's like miscellaneous what is it i guess what does a typical day look like for you well it looks pretty much the same every weekday i get up at 7 15 uh i uh take a shower i get dressed i have the clothing that i want already set up i have breakfast uh at breakfast i read uh usually uh two or three newspapers and uh, I have, as you know, the same breakfast every day, uh, Cheerios and a banana. And as you know, the reason I eat a banana is because once, uh, and I tell this story in the book, once uh, the, a famous tennis player stayed with us, and I do continue to try to play doubles tennis, and he ate 12 bananas a day. Wow. That's a lot. And uh, so I asked him why, and he said the, the potassium in the bananas helps replace the muscles that he used. So I figured, what the hell, I'll have a banana every day, maybe it'll improve my tennis game. But I gotta tell you something, once I tried having four bananas at breakfast, and you just feel really bad, <laughs> it's not a good idea. Anyway, so basically I do that, and I, I get out of the house and you know uh, drive over to Harvard Business School. Uh, I'm usually out of the house by five of eight, 10 of eight, something like that. I try to teach my classes at 8.30 in the morning. That has two good effects. One is it lets me get started early. And the second of all, I know the students are serious when they're willing to take an 8.30 class. So I'm teaching a course now on introduction to uh, tax strategies for business people. So I get to the class early. I get, well, I, I pick on the way to class, I get a cup of coffee. Uh, there happens to be a little coffee place at Harvard Business School. Uh, the woman there is always smiling. She always tells me how great everything is. It's a, it's a real pickup. I get to class and then I prepare the board uh, for the class because I believe in sort of uh, very much in visual things. So I teach the class. Uh, I come back. I come to my office. Uh, and then depending on the day, I will do uh, usually in the morning. Uh, I'll see what's coming on the email. I usually uh, go through which ones are important, deal with them, and, uh, you know, sort of do whatever's on my agenda for that day. I have lunch usually with people. And um, then uh, invariably in the afternoon, I take a half an hour power nap. And, uh, you I've talk about that. this I'm, in the book also. I'm, I'm, this I'm, is a paradigm shift for people, I have to say. People are going <laughs> to, when they read that part of the book, they're going to freak out a little bit, right? Well, you're right. That's the part of the book that people are really worried about. I mean, I do a lot of presentations at corporate venues, and they invariably say to me, but don't don't mention that thing about apps. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you could talk about it, doing exercise. And I do believe strongly that you're wasting a lot of your exercise if you do it first thing in the morning or late at night. In fact, late at night tends to keep you up. The best time to do 
your exercise is in the afternoon when your body is starting naturally to, to sort of go down a little. But I've trained myself, so I have my blindfold, I carry it around, I put my feet up and I'm out for a half an hour. Uh, in fact, uh, I did that just this afternoon before you came in. You went to rest up for this interview. We got Techie who helped me set this up, came in and uh, he immediately said to me, how do you do it? How do you do it? He wanted to know how to do it. He's been working on his yoga. And so we talked about how he could do it. But uh, the key thing is just to do it for half an hour. Start off by setting your uh, set your BlackBerry or iPhone as an alarm. You've got to train yourself to do it a half an hour. Above half an hour, you're really not getting a lot of benefit. Have you and had then, people? Have you had people go, Bob? I almost got fired because I went to my boss and asked for a nap. Or what stories have you heard about that? People do discuss with me. They say, "Gee, I'm afraid." You know, it's one thing you're now, you know, professor or you're pre uh, president and right. You're in the and stuff. And I said, you know, I used to be, a, you know, a young guy, was, you know, in a small office or you know, in a very transparent office, and um, you know, you just you have. You have to convince your boss that you're really getting a lot done. And then your boss doesn't really care. See, when I, like, remember when I was president of Fidelity, you have all these analysts, and some of them are very good. But, you know, like, if somebody decides they're a little quirky, they want to come in at 5 a.m. in the morning and leave at 10 a.m., and they have great ideas, great stock ideas, why do I care? Why do I care what they're doing, you know, how they do it? I want to know what they are achieve not the amount right. of time they put in so when they do it but uh, you're right to say that a lot of people especially people in open offices these days say how would i do this i think you have to sneak off in a little corner but having said all that if you don't want to do a nap you don't feel comfortable doing it use a half an hour to take a walk that's also good you know get the exercise get the mental break that's part of what's going on so uh, I understand why some people uh, uh, recoil at the idea of a straight out nap, but um, you know there are other ways to get similar to the similar place. And you know, in terms of my normal day, I try to get a lot done. You know, I have my list of ten things that I want to get done, and uh, you know, hopefully by the end of the day, I've gotten most of them done. Was there a time, mm -hmm. Bob, in your career or life that you weren't productive? Uh, actually. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think that I've been pr pretty productive throughout all my career. Now, you know, at times I worked at the SEC as an official for quite a few years. And um, I guess you might say that there's a bureaucracy there. And so that's a little bit of a constraint on your productivity in a sense. If you want to actually get a rule out or you actually want to uh, get uh, some policy implemented. So that may take a while. And of course, working with legislation. But on the other hand, you can be productive in your own way. And I think that's a key distinction. Um, there are organizations that are more or less receptive to productivity. The ones that are successful tend to be the most receptive to people getting things done and not so hung up on exactly how they do it. But if you're in an organization that isn't that receptive, you can still do a lot yourself. So if you're in a government organization, of course, you can't get legislation passed. You can't uh, get a rule out, but you can do the homework that you need to do, the analysis to bring your part along. And so that's why I would say I was productive, even if the organization uh, wasn't particularly productive. Yeah. Last thing, the SEC is a small agency, which has a good esprit, or at least did uh, at the time that I was involved with it. And so I think it was, at that time, uh, one of the most productive agencies in the government. Most, you know, one thing I think about with productivity also incorporates family life. Talk a little bit about work-life balance, you know, balancing that work-life with trying to get home for dinner or be with the kids or, or you know, that aspect. Well, that's an important thing. And, uh, you know, being in the finance industry, I deal with a lot of people who say that I have to work every night till 11 p.m., and I asked them, why is it you have to do that? Oh, there's an emergency. And I think, can there really be an emergency every night in the week? And I don't think so. And part of it, you realize that some of these places have the culture of what I call FaceTime. They have to be there. They think if the person's there, then they're working hard. They might actually just be playing games or doing something, but at least they're there. And so I really think you have to really ch change that. I myself always 
committed myself to get home and have dinner with my wife and kids um, by 7 p.m. That was our time. And, you know, uh, there are there were a number of situations where it wasn't easy and, and maybe one night a week I couldn't do it and occasionally I would travel. But I would say on average, 80 percent of the time I was there for dinner. And this is one of the things I preach, especially now uh, with all the technology, you know, 20 years ago, you didn't have so much technology. So now if you walk in the door and immediately your phone, your iPhone rings and, you know, people are emailing you. Distracting, yeah. That's really distracting. So I will actually wait outside my front door and do all my phones and, you know, phone mails and emails and everything so that when I can get into the door, it's all off, you know, and then I can spend quality time uh, of an hour or two at least and then if I have to go to back to work at 10 o'clock, you know, make some, when I used to run a global asset manager, make some calls to Asia or these things, then you do it. And here's one of the interesting things. You know, sometimes I'd be struggling with a problem, you know, uh, maybe a personnel problem or maybe a strategy problem. And I really couldn't figure out the answer. And I go home uh, two or three hours, talk to my wife, talk to the kids, maybe watch some TV with them, talk to them about their homework. And then I went back at 10 o'clock to my office in my home, and all of a sudden the answer would come to me. And it was like, you know, it's just that my mind was relaxed, and all of a sudden, you know, I could do it. And I think that that culture of getting home by 7 o'clock is all part of the general, I would say, mission that I'm on to emphasize it's what you get accomplished. That's what's important, not the number of hours you put in. And when I was president of Fidelity, every Wednesday afternoon, my kids were in various athletic programs, and they tended to have games around 4.30, so I, or 4 o'clock, I forget. I would leave the office at 3 o'clock and go to their games. And it was like a shock to the whole organization. You know, people said, and people still tell me now, you freed me up totally. I was afraid to go home early to uh, my child's uh, piano recital. I couldn't do it, you know? I just couldn't bring myself to doing it. And people would come up to me and say, well, well, is it possible that my kid's in this play, you know, and it's out of nowhere, so I really need to leave at four o'clock. And, and you know, uh, it, can you let me do that? And, and, you know, I'll really get my work done. And I said, look, what's important is you figure out how to get your work done. You know, I trust you that if you take this time off, that you'll you'll be you'll, you'll be getting your work done, and that's the important thing. And not everyone has a boss like you, though. So what <laughs> do, what do they do if they don't? Well, I think I I think you and that's I have a whole chapter on managing your boss. Yes, and you one do. Of the yeah. most profound things Peter Drucker, the guru, said is, you know, that you may not like your boss, you may not be fond of him or her, but you better manage him or her because the, your boss is one of the most important people in your life. I think you have to sit down and talk to them. You have to understand what's driving them. You have to sort of figure out a good way to communicate. You have to meet regularly and set priorities. And the most important thing is you have to deliver. For yeah, if you're performing, then it's not going to be. Yeah. That you're going to deliver. If your boss doesn't have confidence and you're, you're going to deliver, then you got a problem. But if you're a deliverer, if you perform, and you perform on the wavelength. Now, part of that means that you got to sit down with your boss and figure out what the wavelength is. What does the boss really want? And if you if you if you uh, if you are really delivering, you know, week after week, then most bosses are pretty flexible as the as to how you do it. That's yeah. more up to you. Bob, I wanted to find out too. Um, I know a lot went into writing the book. What's your personal favorite story from the book? Uh, my personal favorite story is the story when I was in junior high school and I was uh, just, I, I sort of went to a pretty staid grammar school, but my junior high school was sort of rough. I was out there playing a little basketball and a guy who would now be called the hood, or we call him hood, hoodlums, you know, was in seventh grade. I was probably 11 or 12 and this guy was 15. He'd stay back all the time. And so it's the story about how he told me that uh, actually I had to bring in a chocolate bunny to school every Friday. And I said, gee, I never saw that in the rules of the school. I never heard about that. He says, oh, yeah. 
he says, you definitely got to bring it in because we have shop on Friday and there are all those hammers there. So it was a pretty clear threat. So that's when I started to learn the art of negotiation and, you know, negotiated with him about how we were going to do this and uh, played him one on one in basketball. And the deal was that if he won, I would bring the chocolate bunnies. But if I won, he would bring the chocolate bunnies. I won the one-on-one game, but I never had the nerve to ask him for those chocolate bunnies. So your basketball skills came in handy. It did come in handy. I mean, you know, there were some rough characters in my high school and my junior high school. A lot rougher than most people encounter. What, Bob, what stories did not make the book that you're thinking, these are great, but you couldn't include everything? Well, you know, there is a story, it's a true story, about you know, how I first encountered social class in the United States. So I lived in Bridgeport. We weren't very wealthy, but you know, something in general, Bridgeport people weren't that wealthy. And so I never really thought about it very much. Uh, But I think it was in April or May, I had gotten into Harvard and I, I, they were nice enough to give me a scholarship and a loan and a job. Uh, So there was a meeting, there was sort of a dinner, that was, it was a dinner held by the Harvard Club of Connecticut, and I think it was held at either Hotchkiss or Choke, and I remember driving up there, my old jalopy, and when I entered, I thought, this must be Harvard, because it was so elegant, it was so beautiful, I couldn't believe that it was really a high school, but the most important thing is, let's assume it was about 40, quote-unquote, young men who had gotten into Harvard, They went through 38 of them, and each of them had been sponsored by the Harvard Club of Greenwich or the Harvard Club of Westport or the Harvard Club of this. And then they came to two guys, myself and Don Berwick, who's now a very famous doctor. He was head of Medicare. He's done tremendous work in quality stuff. And they said, and here are two guys who managed to get into Harvard without the support of any Harvard Club. Let's give them a hand. And that was my first introduction to social class in the United States. I hadn't even realized that there was this whole network of all these people and all these clubs that were really helping all these guys from, uh, you know, sort of well-to-do families get into Harvard. That's a great story. So why didn't it make the cut? Did your wife wife not like the story or what happened? Uh, I think people were a little worried about it, uh, you know, as being too... uh, it was a combination of two things. One is it doesn't directly relate to productivity. I got gotcha. you. It's just a good story. All, yeah. It is a good story, but doesn't relate to productivity. And second of all, you know, uh, social class in the United States, pretty controversial subject. It's something, uh, you know, be glad to talk about in other contexts, but it may not be a good idea just to flash one story without actually exploring it. Got it. I actually began at Harvard in 1964. And between 64 and 68, Harvard went through an incredible transformation. So, you know, uh, there was a big change in the nature of the students and the nature of uh, social class at Harvard. So it's a big, it's actually a much bigger story. Yeah. And also, one of the things, you know, on the productivity topic is you have a, a saying about Ohio. Can you tell people what that means? My wife did go to the University of Michigan, so she, if it meant something else, she may not like me talking about it. But since it doesn't, it's okay. Yeah, I should say for all those people who played against Ohio State or, or don't like them, or fans, it got nothing to do with the state of Ohio or the Buckeyes or things. Uh, it means only handle it once. And it's really a way of being productive. Uh, and the best application is the emails. You get a lot of emails. I encourage you to look at them see the subject matter, and just pass over the majority of them. But there are some emails that are really important from your boss, from the IRS, uh, from these various things. And my strong uh, uh, urging is answer it right then and there so you only handle it once. And I know so many people who say, well, they're very busy, so they put it in some holding pattern or they did this or that. And then a week later, uh, they remember, and it takes them a half an hour to find it and maybe another half an hour to get up to speed. And of course, in the worst case, uh, they forget about it. So Ohio is a very important uh, concept. And one of the reasons I know it is because my publisher, uh, Harper Collins, when I go in there occasionally, uh, uh, the, the, the people, you know, while I'm waiting for the meeting say to me, hey, Bob, I've become more productive. I'm doing Ohio. <laughs> 
And so they remember it. They say it. It's really it's a catchy phrase, too. I like it. What are Bob, what are two things that you do that you couldn't do without that make you the most productive? Two things that I do. Yeah. Well, as I said, I, I think carefully before I read something uh, about why I'm doing it. And then I really try to read the beginning, the end, and then focus on what I want to get out of it. Yeah. Another thing that I do is I never write without an outline. Uh, and so that's important. And I would say a third thing is I go over my uh, uh, sort of schedule for the next day every night before and really try to think hard about what it is that I want to do and really get them accomplished. I think those are probably three of the most important things. Yeah. I mean, it seems like, Bob, too, in your business career, there's always seems to be a big upward trajectory. Has there yeah. been any painful moments or low points in business oh, for sure, you? Oh, sure, sure, absolutely. You know, uh, you know, I'd say I just mentioned two of them. Is I went to uh, Yale Law School and I stayed on, and I got a uh, did a book on state enterprise in Africa and got a doctorate from the law school. And I wanted to go into teaching, and um, most people said you can't just go into teaching. You've got to go into the real world for a few years and this, but I wasn't really interested in doing it. So I got rejected at about 12 different places. And I was lucky enough to get a one year visiting appointment at Georgetown Law School. And then I did teach, I did write, and then I was able to go. But it's not so much fun to get rejected by 12 people, 12 schools. Another thing in the course of my, I was at Fidelity for 15 years, I'd say somewhere in the middle, uh, I was trying to get a, a job that I, it was a, a very a significant managerial job that I didn't get. So I started to look around about leaving. Uh, I had gone to law school with the Clintons. Uh, and so uh, one of the things I was considered to be was in the uh, special trade representative. And what's interesting is, uh, and I didn't try to hide it, but it, there was a newspaper article saying that I was being vetted for that job. And I think that provoked people. Did you the, write that article? Or? I did oh, write the article. Okay. No, no, it was a typical Washington leak, you know, when, where somebody leaks this so they can figure out whether or not actually, you know, there's something terrible in your history that had to come out. Well, nothing terrible came out, but the people at Fidelity must have thought, well, do we really want to lose this guy? And so uh, uh, they decided uh, that they would give me promotion. But, uh, you know, it's it was pretty difficult. Uh, in both cases where, you know, you think you deserve a promotion, you don't get it, or, you know, you get rejected from a lot of places. I'm, I'm sure many people have gone through that. Yeah, for sure. What's been a, a proud accomplishment for you? I know you have a me, you know many of them. What's one that you accomplished that still amazes you? Well, you know, uh, I, I like to think that my proudest you know, accomplishments are my children who are, who are both very uh, successful and wonderful kids. And my older brother, who happened to pass away early, I'm very close to his two sons, and they've done well, too, and I feel very good about that. Professionally, the one thing, you know, uh, that I really feel the best about is something called the Fidelity Charitable Gift Fund. At one time, um, uh, the chairman of Fidelity, Ned Johnson, came to me and he said he'd really like to create a vehicle that would give the middle class the sort of foundation-like instruments that wealthy people had had and he is he is a very wealthy person so uh, and he said but i have these three letters from these tax lawyers that tells me impossible to do this and so i took it on as a challenge and uh, we designed a vehicle we got approval with a few little curl cues uh, from the irs and i'm proud to say that it now has over three billion dollars wow and 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 people what it is is it allows you to give money, get the deduction this year, and then it'll invest you for you. And then four, five, ten years later, you make recommendations about it being given out to charity. So it is a middle class person's foundation. And it's I believe it's really democratized that aspect of the investing and giving business. And uh, now in many years, it's one of the you know the biggest sources of charitable uh, donations in the country. So I feel really good about it, both because it was a very tough, uh, you know, challenge and because the results 
uh, I think have been so beneficial to charities. Yeah, that, that's amazing. And on the kid front and family front, how has your, um, your wife influenced your career? Well, my wife has been a huge influence. She's a psychotherapist, now retired, and she's also a, 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 a painter, a painter of oils. And I would say, you know, uh, she, she definitely has worked real hard to make me more sensitive to how other people react. To what I'm saying and what I'm doing, and she's also uh, took the main oar in terms of raising the kids because her her uh, practice was flexible enough that she could practice for five or six hours a day and be home. So she was clearly critical, uh, and she's also uh, you know the person who really gives me the most honest feedback. Right. Very so well, tell me about one of those honest feedback sessions where she put you in line. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I feel because I get the enough. same thing. We'd go to a dinner party, and you know, I'd say something, and afterwards she said, "You know, that person was probably really offended by what you said because didn't you realize that that person had such a background and you know had uh, this experience, and you treated it so cavalierly, you know?" And so, um, you know, she's she's definitely worked hard to sensitize me to these issues, and. Uh, you know, I, I think I've gotten a lot better, but, you know, uh, I don't think I'm likely to become a psychotherapist, let's <laughs> put it that way. Bob, and people come look to you as a mentor. Who are your mentors? What what piece of advice have your mentors given you? Well, probably my most important mentor, really, in my whole life was the woman. Her name is Helen Clabby, who became Helen Sinto, who was my high school English teacher. Because, really, I was in a pretty rough and tough high school where maybe... 300 kids in the class and 25 or so took the honors class. But she really taught me how to write, how to read, and really lifted my ambitions in terms of what I did and what I was, what I should do, why I should apply to Harvard, et cetera. And, you know, so uh, she, she not only taught me a lot of skills, she taught me to love reading, and she taught me to have much higher ambitions. Uh, another time is that... Um, you know, when I started in academia, there was a guy, unfortunately, he's now died. I, I was sort of in the area, which at that time was nascent, called law and economics, where you apply uh, economic concepts to law. And there was a guy who was teaching where I was, uh, Homer Kripke, who was a leading thinker in that area. And he really encouraged me to develop that and, and uh, actually put in a, a strong word with the publishers. Uh, when I wanted to publish my first book on financial institutions, and it's always hard to get started, so he was he was a great mentor. Yeah. So it seems like there's a theme of teachers. You think that's why you wanted to what, end up teaching? Well, I hadn't thought about it, but you may be right. I I like teaching. I like the physical act of teaching. It's sort of a form of. I think of it as a, partly a form of entertainment, and you know, uh, maybe you know. I could have been a stand-up comedian, but my jokes weren't funny enough. But, you know, in the classroom, I really enjoy the interaction. I don't lecture. And uh, I, wherever I've taught, I've never lectured. And so it's very interactive. I think if you've seen the YouTube, there's now a YouTube video of a talk that I give. So I really enjoy it. I enjoy the interaction. I enjoy the energy. Uh, I enjoy mentoring. Uh, and I guess at this stage of my life, you know, it's it, it's a good thing to do. I feel like you know, uh, conveying some of whatever I've learned to other people. But I also learn a lot from these young people, and I like being around them. Yeah. I have one last question, Bob, and I appreciate your time. But before I ask it, can you tell people where can they reach out and say thank you? Where can they find the book? What's the best uh, website for them to go to? Okay. Well, I have a website, bobposen.com, and Posen is spelled P like in Peter, O-Z like in Zebra, E-N like in Nancy. So that has all my publications. It also has Extreme Productivity. Uh, Extreme Productivity is published by HarperCollins, but probably the easiest place to get it is on Amazon. Yeah. It's sold both in hardback uh, and uh it's discounted now, as most Amazon books, to about $18, or you can get the ebook version. Uh, it's translated now into seven languages. Wow. So, for people who are really interested in Portuguese or German or uh, Mandarin, I keep getting these copies of things that I can't possibly understand. <laughs> but, uh, it's interesting. So, the, those are good. But 
But BobPosen.com is probably the best if you want to see the blogs I've done on productivity or this little video, this little YouTube video probably is the, the single most fun thing that I've done. Yeah, if you go on bobposen.com, you can see the video. There's extreme productivity. I I actually got it on audible.com because I like listening to it, so you can also get it there. Um, but you know, definitely check it out. I've listened to it. It's it's wonderful and very valuable. And the last question I had for you, Bob, is um, what's next? What's the next book? What's uh, the next project that uh, you're going to be working on? Well. Tell you the truth, I, I'm not sure I know the answer. One of the things that I am doing is I'm taking the book and turning it into courses. So uh, I'm now uh, going to give a course on personal productivity at the Harvard Public Health School. They've started a new doctoral program for health administration, and they're making this a required course. I'm also giving an executive ed course on personal productivity in MIT, which, by the way, happens to be March 20th or 21st. That's a two-day, really concentrated course on productivity. So I'm trying to take the ideas and get them into a form uh, where it's a course where we have lots of exercises, lots of things like that. Uh, so that's one thing I'm doing. The second thing is I continue to try to work on retirement, both on Social Security and the thing that I've focused on recently is what I call unfunded retiree health care. Unfortunately, in Massachusetts, we have about $30 billion in unfunded retiree health care. Hmm. It's basically people between about 50 and 65 who've retired from city and other public governments and where there were lots of promises made. Unfortunately, until about 2004, nobody even accounted for this. So that's another sort of project I'm doing. And then the third thing is I'm working with a number of small uh, biotech and tech companies to yeah, I them. saw you work with Medtronics, or you've worked with Medtronics. Well, Medtronic is hardly a small company. Right, right. Outside director, uh, it's now quite a large company, but I'm I'm proud of the work I've done with that. But here in Cambridge, we have lots of small companies, startup companies. So I help them, you know, think about their strategy. I help them raise some money, uh, do this. And the last thing is, uh, I like mentoring. So you know, I I I uh, work with people. A lot of them are new CEOs because they really find the adjustment and, quite frankly, the loneliness of being a new CEO. All of a sudden, they're the top woman or guy, and it's not so easy for them to find people to talk to these issues about. So those are the four or so things that I'm doing at the moment, and they should keep me busy for a while. I'm on, beside Medtronic, I'm on uh, two other, I'm on another for-profit board, Nielsen. I'm... Um, I'm on a board of a subsidiary of the World Bank, and I'm also on a healthcare foundation. So, see, so you seem so relaxed. You'd never know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Sometimes I just have trouble scheduling all these board meetings at once. <laughs> Bob, I appreciate your time. It's been an absolute pleasure and honor. And uh, everyone, check out Extreme Productivity. Thanks, uh, Bob. Thank you. I really wanted to appreciate the uh, fact that you actually read all this stuff and were prepared for the interview. I would say, unfortunately, I've been interviewed by lots of people who didn't really know that much about it, but you're impressive. You really Thank do you. know, and you've really done your homework, and I appreciate it. That means a lot coming from you, so I, I appreciate it back. Take care.